We all have a cornerstone movie. We all have that one movie that means the world to us, that one movie we keep coming back to. It doesn't have to define who we are, but it defines some part of our lives, some time or place or relationship with someone important to us. We're connected to that movie at like some weirdly primal level and every time we see it we're totally flooded with the emotions that are bound to it. It's a movie that's always been there, probably since we were kids and for whatever reason that movie is staying with us forever because we love it more than we could ever really explain. What's my cornerstone movie? You feel that, don't you? It's like someone just set your goddamn soul on fire. Chances are you're feeling that because, well, if you've seen The Lion King, it's probably your cornerstone movie too, or at least it's one of them. This is a movie that, for as long as I've been alive, seems to have made a mark on everyone that's seen it. There's something about this movie that we feel together, something that's made it endure, something that's made its 2019 remake a contentious topic for many of us that love the original so much, and I need to know why that is. I need to know why it's our cornerstone movie. And so, hi, my name is Bailey, and this is why I love... How old were you when you first saw The Lion King? I was probably, I want to say like four or five, but who knows, might have been either side of that. I'm not stressing on specifics because no matter how old you were, this movie had the same effect. Whether you were five or 50, the second Lebo M releases the energy of a neutron star out of his lungs with that Zulu chant, you're there, you're feeling it. I can't think of another movie that leaves as much of an immediate emotional imprint as this one. How many movies become iconic in their first 40 frames? Not many, and even fewer can get us to... No, I'm not crying already. Okay, maybe I am, but I know this gets you feeling all kinds of things too. Seriously, you're on the clock with this movie, and if you don't have at least half an arm worth of goosebumps by the end of the first scene, I'm calling the cops. As Carmen Twilly sings it herself, it moves us all. You can't argue with that, it's science. Look, this is what I want to focus on. Where does that emotion come from? How does a movie about singing animal sovereigns get that kind of response from us over and over and over again? Part of it's nostalgia by this stage, sure. That's why it's a cornerstone movie for us, but that doesn't happen in a vacuum. No, to hit that cornerstone status, a movie has to really speak to us on a personal level about the things that we experience in our own lives, and The Lion King's brilliance lies in the way it knows exactly what to say. In a way, The Lion King is storytelling as education. That probably sounds like an easy thing to say because, like, aren't all movies education? Yeah, sure, I gained a lot of life lessons from the cat in the hat, mainly that the cupcake and eater can instantly make cupcakes out of anything you have, you have in the kitchen. But no movie that I can think of hits the raw universality of what The Lion King is teaching. Everyone dies, the world goes on without us, and that's beautiful. Remember being five years old and getting hit with When we die, our bodies become the grass, and the antelope eat the grass. And you're just sitting there thinking, what the f***? Even as an adult, the things The Lion King is talking about are not easy to grapple with. This is a story about growing up, about letting go and moving on, but also about never forgetting where you came from or the people that made you who you are today. I think The Lion King is playing in a thematic territory that nothing that Disney had made before this was even close to touching, and when a movie bypasses being just flat out entertainment and ventures towards becoming a straight up user manual for coping with life's biggest struggles, that's when you're dealing with a story that's transcended its form. It feels like The Lion King was the movie that made animation matter to Western audiences because it made adults realise that these things weren't just moving paintings that looked impressive and also entertained kids, but creatively unlimited canvases that artists could use to evoke knockout emotion on in a way that the old actor in front of a camera never could. Let's actually talk about animation here for a second because, oh boy! Here's one of the few hills I'll die on. 
Animation, and not just the hand-drawn kind, but the computer-generated stuff too, is the most fiercely creative form of expression that human beings have. It's cinema with its capacity for colour and composition and moving image mixed with music and voice, but when it's conjured from a blank page with nothing but your imagination to limit you, the possibilities of what you can create and evoke get blown wide open. Great animation is pure magic. Every single frame, 24 frames a second, and I will never not be 100% staggered by the sheer wizardry that The Lion King is throwing down in that department from the word go. Jesus, I was not ready for that at all. If the opening scene is the call to action that cracks your heart open so that the emotion can just flow freely, then the experience that follows is a pilgrimage of the soul made possible by a team of animators at the top of their game. Here's something to chew on. It's 1992, Beauty and the Beast has just been nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards. You're an animator at Disney Animation Studios and you're given a choice of which of the next two projects you want to work on. There's a romantic epic about a 17th century Native American princess who falls in love with an English colonizer against the backdrop of the unspoiled American wilderness. Or there's an experimental movie about feline monarchs in Africa that features a farting warthog. You go to a meeting, held by the studio chairman, Jeffrey Katzenberg, where he tells you the romantic epic will be a smash hit sensation and the farting warthog movie is gonna be way less of a success. Now, you get to choose which movie you'd rather work on. I hear you screaming, GIVE ME THE FIGHTING WARTHOG! And damn right, that's where I'd want to go also, but in 1992, pretty much every top animator at Disney opted for Pocahontas, which, remembering it's 1992 and the last romantic epic copped major Oscar love, I don't blame them for. At the time, all the staff at Disney Animation would have had no idea that The Lion King was going to be the monumental success that it's become. Let's peep those box office numbers real quick. Ooh. The point here is not, yo, Pocahontas get dunked on, but that the team with no faith in them pulled off the Disney upset of the century. That's not saying it was a competition between the two movies, and being the highest grossing animated flick of the last 25 years is definitely not an upset, but this group of young creatives were on the team with something to prove because they were on the team that nobody believed in. And as I've said many, many times before, having some Something to prove pushes you to excel. If I were to show you any character design from The Lion King, you know the name immediately. Not just the name, you know the way they sound, the way they move, and the way they make you At a point, the whole hand-drawn thing falls away and you're just watching living, breathing animals, which is no simple thing to pull off. Actually, saying these characters are animals is only half true because, yeah, they are literally animals, but the creators behind them worked really hard to push each creature closer and closer to their human counterparts. Here's where animation like this becomes so perfect. All you have to do is evoke a thing for us to see it as that. Does Pumbaa look like a warthog? Barely, but he looks close enough and the rest can be exaggerated and warped and transformed to the point that the animal is just as human as we are through their features and mannerisms. You know what can't do that? Live action that goes for hard realism. Yes, I know it's CG, but that's not what they're going for, is it? It looks amazing too, like totally lifelike, but the argument here is that by shifting the story to live action, you lose the magic that the imagination of animation holds. What you gain in realism, you lose in shape and contrast and color. The image no longer evokes an idea or a feeling because it hands it straight to you. And I don't think the emotional response to that is ever quite as strong. This is a reimagining through a different form that seeks to evoke the old rather than to find something new, and I totally see the beauty and wonder that it has in its own right, but that is where the fan contention lies. You know what no one contends though? How freaking beautiful the original looks. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. You remember seeing this for the first time and just dying? How do human beings even make something that looks this beautiful? I don't know, it's just art. 
You know what? You take a snapshot of any frame from this movie and you've got yourself a gallery overflowing with artistry. It's all stunning, even this frame of Zazu. No, especially this frame of Zazu. God, I love that guy. Whoever thought of getting Mr. Bean to voice a pompous hornbill wordsmith should have at least, like, five Nobel Prizes and at least another ten for Nathan Lane as Timon. Disney had kind of a monopoly over the whole comedic sidekick thing during their 90s renaissance and for me, they just do not get any better than the theatrical meerkat energy of Timon, especially when he's playing off Pumbaa's dopey sincerity. What do you want me to do, dress and drag and do the hula? Seriously, find me a more stupidly hysterical joke in one of these movies. It doesn't exist. I mean, I'm sure it does. It's all just down to personal taste. All of the Lion King's side characters are outright glorious, including the three hyenas and especially old googly-eyed Ed. But there's one character in this movie that I love above all else, and he is simply to die for. Disney villains, hell, villains in general, don't get much better than Scar. Absolutely everything about this sly, slimy, conniving wannabe autocrat, or should I say, autocat, <laughs> That sucked. Everything about this compellingly evil bad guy is just so absurdly, ridiculously perfect. I've got to give a shout out to Andreas Deja, the supervising animator behind not just Scar, but also the equally legendary Gaston and Jafar. Yeah, you see it too, right? I've got to give him a mention because Scar is so insanely well realized and it actually blows my mind. I mentioned before how animation allows you to exaggerate and warp and transform, and no character in this movie displays that better than Scar, who seems to twist and contort around every word that slithers out of his mouth. Honestly, Scar is just as much a snake as he is a lion, and Deja's design does a killer job of translating those traits and vocal qualities into his actual physical appearance. I mean, look at his eyes. And oh, Jeremy Irons, Jeremy goddamn Irons. I didn't even know it was possible to go this hard with a vocal performance, but Irons gives it his all, bringing every ounce of sass and sarcasm and straight up camp that he was capable of delivering and just, oh, he's so good. I gotta say though, the animation in this movie really hits its peak during the songs. If there's a more beautifully animated three minutes of American film than Can You Feel the Love Tonight, I will quite literally pass out. Wait, we need to talk about the music. How have we not talked about the music? I don't know if you're aware of this, but ABBA was actually the first pick for the songwriters of this movie. I'm not messing with you, this was a real thing. I can't even imagine what that would have been like. See, I promise you, The Lion King would not be all that it is to us today if not for the crack team composing combo of Elton John, lyricist Tim Rice, Lebo M and Hans Zimmer. Oh, Hans Zimmer. It's crazy to me that I've been doing this show for a year now without mentioning the music of King Hans once, so it's time to make up for that right frickin' now. Few movies have music that can speak so directly to our emotions and evoke such a visceral reaction every single time, utterly without fail. I kid you not, I've cried that much just editing this video because I cannot pass over a second of love tonight without, oh Jesus, here I go again. I can't really put it down to anything other than straight up sorcery at this stage because having that much emotional control through the combo of instruments and voice cannot be possible, should not be possible, and yet King Hans and company somehow made it happen. It's not just the soul-stirring ballads either. Anyone who doesn't lose their minds as they're flooded with childish glee during I just can't wait to be king has obviously never known happiness and I'm so very, very sorry for that. As a kid, that song was my anthem. It goes full pop, just exploding with colour and creativity, and it's so, so much fun. Actually, it was my anthem on the days that my anthem wasn't Hakuna Matata. Hell, that song is still my anthem. 
Those are words to live by, but it gets harder and harder to live by them the older you get, you know, because there's so much to worry about. Still, I try, and the way adult Simba just tears his way into It means no worries is still the best thing ever. Also, Be Prepared is a bop, and yes, I know it's a song, but that's like an all-timer of a villain's plan speech, right? If there's one thing the Lion King's songs do really effectively, and they do everything really effectively, it's pushing story and character development through the music. Pretty much every song advances the story, and our characters aren't ever really the same person, the same animal they were going into it after the singing is through. King Hans has a leitmotif game that is totally off the charts here too, making particular instrumental themes synonymous with a character or an idea almost instantly, to the point that when you hear this... You immediately think of Mufasa. It's grand and powerful and it feels like it encompasses everything around it and where King Hans really gets to you is in how he evolves its meaning over time. At first you're getting that sense of awe and majesty that surrounds the King of the Pride Lands but after he's gone and Simba is far away it becomes a theme of guilt and loss and later the pull of responsibility. You can hear it when Simba talks talks about the stars and when Rafiki signals to Pride Rock in the end. I'm sorry, I just get caught up in how powerful this scene is every time. Scar's been defeated, the hyenas, I guess, got burned alive, and it's time for Simba to take his place as the rightful king. It's kind of crazy how earned this feels when it happens and how emotionally rewarding it is because of that. The last 80-ish minutes have been beautiful and hilarious and exciting, but they've also been pretty punishing too. This is a story that takes us through the emotional ringer for sure. Sure, no two ways about it, but our 83 minutes of feeling as we sit here and watch this movie has nothing on what Simba has gone through in the entire lifetime we've watched him move through on screen. The kid lost his dad right in front of us and... <sighs> yep, yep, that's... <laughs> Alright, looks like I'm still not over Mufasa's death, like at all. So no wonder that it took Simba pretty much all of his adolescence to reconcile with it. Losing a loved one, especially a parent, that's messed up. And here's the, I guess here's what I've been working towards since the start. It's something that we all have to go through one day. The Lion King is not an easy movie, no matter how much it feels like it is. I don't know many movies, especially ones squared at kids, that look death in the face and say, this is it. We all got to deal with this one day, one way or another. Bambi, this is not. You're going to have to experience it firsthand here. Just, yeah, like that. That's a lot for a kid to take in, and while I guess that a lot of it probably goes over our head at that age because of all the wacky animals and funny songs that break up the heavy existential overtones, the reality of what The Lion King is about sets in hard once you're old enough to understand it. Everyone dies, the world goes on without us, and that's beautiful. Mufasa knows that Simba cannot grasp it yet, but that doesn't stop him from explaining the lesson that the Lion King hinges on. One day, the people who raised us won't be here anymore, but they will live on within us for as long as we remember them, and their wisdom is still going to guide us long after they're gone. You have forgotten who you are, and so forgotten me. This iconic scene isn't a physical conversation between father and son, even though it's expressed as that. It's an internal one, with Simba drawing on the memory of his father and the things his father taught him. As Rafiki points out moments earlier, He lives in you. I don't know about you, but that's got to be the most comforting thing I can imagine hearing in the wake of a personal loss like Simba's. No one is ever really gone because they're always going to be a part of who you are and you can never, ever forget that. It's just so freaking beautiful. 
It's an incredibly profound statement for a movie like this to make, but it's also an incredibly universal one, and that is the power of The Lion King. This is a movie about life itself, about being a part of this world and all that that entails, and yeah, movies just cannot get any more universal than that. Simba's journey through life, with all its trials and hardships, its ups and downs, is at its core, our journey through life too. We're not exactly royalty, but the sentiments of this movie are still totally true to all of us. We see ourselves within this story wholeheartedly because we all know what it's like to have to grow up, and we all know what it's like to lose someone, and how that has an incredible effect on us. We all know what it's like to wish we were older, and what it's like to get there and wish we could go back, to wish we didn't have to face up to all the responsibilities that go with it. Eventually, We'll know what it's like to pass all that we've learned on to our own kids, and later, what it's like to see them grow beyond us. The realisation for Timon and Pumbaa here that this wonderful phase of their life is over, and that their way of living is going to change forever now that Simba has reached adulthood, is one of the most heartbreaking things I have ever seen in a movie. No joke, I teared up just saying that again. Just like everyone else in this story, our two comedic sidekicks lose something they cherish to the passage of time, and it hurts. I don't think I really understood what was going on here until now, now that I myself have moved out of home, because that's exactly what my parents must have felt. The circle just keeps on moving. I really don't think we know how to process this stuff as kids at all, but the fact that it's there is why I believe The Lion King stays with us as we grow up. When we're five, we understand that it's a movie about how big the world is and about how we all have a special place in it no matter who we are, because each of us has an impact on those around us. That's an amazing message in its own right, but... As you get older, The Lion King starts to mean so much more. This is a movie that grows up with us, and that's why it stays relevant to us no matter where we're at in the circle of life. I think that's why The Lion King is standing the test of time, and why it continues to mean as much to us as it does today. It's the way this story takes our most universal human experiences, life, and death and growing up and celebrates them with these super eloquent, thoughtful lessons through voice and music and staggeringly god-tier animation. This is a movie about talking animals, sure, but the empathy that flows through it is entirely human and that's what we connect to. That's why it's our cornerstone movie and that's why I love Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for watching this video. I had so much fun making it. I've finally done a video on The Lion King. It's a movie I've wanted to talk about forever because I love it so much. And to finally have this video that kind of covers everything I could have ever possibly wanted to say about this movie that means so much to me, uh, that's fantastic. So hopefully you guys loved watching this video as much as I loved making it. I don't know when my next video is gonna be out. I know what the video is. I know it's the biggest project I have ever undertaken on YouTube and I know that it is kind of what this channel has been building towards being able to do is what I'm kind of covering in my next video. So I'm super excited for that. If you want to be there to see it as soon as it drops, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already. You can also follow me on Twitter at Loverboy Media. We can all hang out and chat on there and that's what I like to do. Also, if you really, really want to help support this channel, you can support on Patreon where I offer a bunch of cool exclusive rewards that kind of show the behind the scenes of what goes on with this channel. There's early sneak peeks of the videos as I'm going through editing them and there's also kind of behind the scenes documentaries on how these things get put together. So that is all there on Patreon. Thank you so much to anyone who is supporting on there already. That kind of support means the absolute world to me. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of you who watch these videos. Go and comment on this video, like it, uh, let your friends know about it, share it with the world out there, and remember, empathy first.